all CEOs, me included, we don't actually know what we're doing. They're all sharks, so all you got to do, though, is no shark bait. I don't think we've ever talked about this before. <laughs> we can capture all of the wallet share. First place you start is with the product. That's just the first nut. This is the Capital Stack. Hey, everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack podcast, where I talk to founders, operators, and investors about all things value creation in startups and SaaS products and vertical SaaS and tech enabled services. Uh, today, I'm talking to a good friend and someone that has worked with uh, two DWP Capital. Portfolio companies, Nick Steinwalk, who hello has, everybody, yeah, hi. Um, you've got a great shirt on. You look great. Thank you. In, in magenta. Um, <laughs> how are you? Are you? Are you? Are you? Like, what's it like being back at a DWP portfolio company? Um, I like knowing that I got behind a company that you did your diligence on. Um, so that usually makes the job a little bit easier. Um, and I like working with the founders that you seem to like. So that's been pretty cool. Yeah. Is there a common theme with the founders that I like that you've noticed? They're good people. They're resilient and gritty. Um, and they're pretty focused. Uh, so I don't know if that's always the case with founders, but the ones that I've come across that you've been backing are share those qualities. Yeah. 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 Hopefully they're winners, you know, it's still kind of early in the, during the test of time. But, um, I feel like integrity and focus specifically in the vertical SaaS realm, um, is, is, is you have to have that customer empathy, right? Um, if you don't give a shit about your customers and you don't have that subject matter expertise, it's pretty hard to build a product. Yeah, it did just cut out for some reason. Um, but yes, it is really hard to start companies and early stage SaaS companies. Um, yeah, it's going to require all those characteristics and more for sure. So tell me, Nick, what are you doing? Tell me your story. Um, and what are you doing now besides, you know, schlepping yeah. for, for DWP Capital Portfolio? <laughs> um, yeah, I started many years ago uh, as an engineer. Um, I got out of school with a degree in signal processing communications. Um, and it was either work for like missile and defense companies um, or just take, take another engineering gig that came my way. So I did the latter and I didn't like it. And eventually I traveled across the country, took a little sabbatical, climbed and surfed. And then I landed at a healthcare startup, health tech startup called Reflection Health in San Diego here. And I have been doing mostly health tech product management uh, ever since then, back in like 2012, I think. So that's the story in a nutshell. Is that because you're a masochist that you do healthcare? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I like endless problems that have really ambiguous solutions. And, uh, but I really do, seriously, I really like working closely with doctors or serving doctors um, because it's good when they don't have to worry about all the other things that go along with healthcare. So um, yeah, I guess there's some ideals behind it, um, but that's what I like to get up in the morning and do. And so, you know, you've, you've gone through several cycles, you know, talking within, you know, healthcare organizations, probably mostly on the provider side, correct? Not necessarily. Um, I, I mean, the providers are always kind of the conduit to the patients. Um, but for example, that first startup that I was talking about, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, it was kind of like bringing a bazooka to a knife fight. So it was telerehabilitation before that was even a thing. Um, like we're barely in telemedicine right now and we're even finding some of the limitations to that. And this was 
using machine vision to administer post-acute care like physical therapy. Um, and it was a great product. Um, I think it delivered a lot of value, but like the system wasn't kind of set up for it, if you will. But at the end of the day, like we had to test it with real patients and we ended up like getting a, a great system to get these, these patients to actually come into the office. We were working with senior centers on uh, fall prevention, that sort of a thing. And we got to make sure working directly with the patients that these, uh, these systems that were like next gen were easy and navigable by, by older folks. So it was cool. It's a good experience. And what, what kind of stuff have you, were you doing on the provider side? On the provider side, um, at that particular company? No, just in general. In, in general, um, it's mostly about reducing burden for providers. Like, I think if you were to wave a magic wand, right, tomorrow, providers just want to practice medicine. They just want to work with patients and get them healthy and have that, like, awesome doctor-patient relationship. Um, and it's surprisingly hard to create that situation in our, our healthcare system today. Um, so I guess, I guess when I did work for the federal government with CMS, a lot of the systems there were like lowering overhead, but also providing like reducing the amount of burden that doctors uh, encounter just to report outcomes to the federal government. Um, with the e-consult platform at Arista MD, we're all about just like clinical operational workflows so that doctors didn't have to make these additional logistical judgments of like, should this go to an e-consult or not? And just kind of integrate that into the flow of care. So there's just like, when I'm working with doctors, I'm like, let them be doctors is usually what right. I'm going for. Yeah. And so it, from a product perspective, and, you know, I guess a commercialization usage perspective, what, what are the, what were the friction points? Getting it paid for is it always. Just, everyone's just too fucking busy. To, to, is yeah. it, right, so getting it paid for, like getting real, yeah. getting real ROI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's so funny. There's like three sales in every B2B health tech SaaS sale. There's like this first top line sale where you're like healthcare administration, getting them to buy off on the actual value. And then there's the sale to the people who are going to help you actually implement it and roll it out. And then there's the last sale to the actual doctors that have to use it. So it's all of those are, are necessary in my experience to get a B2B health tech SaaS product out the door. If it's in the, the like clinical flow. And sense? so is, I mean, is that because, yeah, no, it makes sense. So is that because you feel that we are on like a fee for service reimbursement? So like mentally they're saying, okay, we have, you know, we have a, you know, you see procedure, right? We get paid for a procedure. That number goes yeah. up and down based on reimbursement. And then we have doctor and we pay doctor. And then everything else is kind of like this nebulous, like SGNA, right? That kind of mm -hmm. sits around. Yeah. And so do they just do they just not believe that the SGNA has too much bloat? Um like how are they thinking about that? I it's, mean I, I mean I, yeah. I was talking I was talking to like a an ASC an ASC owner mm -hmm. operator. Mm. He had like a huge management, you know, company and I was telling him all these different things, you know, like these different software companies that I'm seeing. I'm seeing all this growth in ASCs, um really like the category and he's just like, yeah, it's just really hard to sell software because Unless it, you know, increases the amount of surgeries that we can do a day, we don't care. <laughs> yeah. Period. Yeah. The bottom line, you're just like, okay, so let's go back to ASCs is like a great example. But like, what if you're talking about primary care? These doctors are already like super overworked and like doing their notes at night after work to close out all of those notes in progress. And you're like, how are we going to get those doctors to see more patients? It's literally, I, I, don't, I don't think it's really possible unless you actually are talking about like 
health coaches in the mix and like a totally different system that, you know, well, that's, that's a regulatory issue. That's not a technical totally. issue, right? That's right. Like how can we how can we get nurses totally. to do more? How can we get nurse yeah. practitioners to do more? And then you're talking about like billing optimization and there's like products around that. But then like with ASCs, you're like, this is literally we're a conveyor belt of patients coming in for s- surgeries. How do we see more of them and deliver like based on our quality like guidelines? Right. So, you, so you're starting, you're, so you're seeing quality, right? That's a new, that's a new, that's a new, you know, kind of effect where I guess it more patients doesn't necessarily mean the, you know, more money, right? They can actually have get penalized for taking at bad outcome patients. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, man, medicine's complicated. So like, you're like, you're like, like Hey, are, are our patients, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are <laughs> patients starting out unhealthy or is it our surgeons, you know, and obviously like having dabbled in hospital quality reporting a little bit, like that's a great question to ask. Um, well, yeah, how, do you, how, do you, how do you, how do you, how do you gauge attribution, right? Like, you know, and how mm-hmm. was your surgery or your thing attributed to a better performance or be a demise, right? Like, yeah, there's just, yeah. There's just, it's just, it's, it's an unsolvable problem. Yeah. Um, or a very expensive problem to try to or, solve with, yeah. with questionable returns. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so, you know, you look at it, you know, administrative buy-in, clinical buy-in, you know, uh, getting mind share as a friction, but so that's a business problem, right? That's yeah. not necessarily a product problem. Yeah. Well, what I've been really fascinated by lately is, all right, the doctor salaries have been going up, as you know, and the margins on a lot of these health systems has been getting thinner and thinner. I hear tell of a lot of health systems out there that you think that they are flush and they're like national leaders. And a lot of their clinics are actually losing money. And so there's a lot of things that these systems can use in terms of health tech solutions that are going to improve the lives, the day-to-day practice of these providers. And hopefully they can be a factor that differentiates them as like a place of work. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm speculating a little bit, but I'm like, it is hyper competitive out there in terms of attracting doctors. Um, for oh, these the, yeah, systems. we have a huge problem. Um, there's somebody I want to introduce you to. Um, it reminds me, you should definitely look at his <sighs> newsletter, but he wrote about the juniorization of healthcare. Right? Mm. And, and, you know, the, the ability to, um, uh, you know, to, to really start like, you know, doing that practicing the top of the license, you know, uh, yeah. t- t- type deals and really building out organizations that are, you know, MA nurse practitioner focused and, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. it meets resistance with the doctors, despite how overworked they are, they feel like they offer better, you know, better care and they do this and they talk to the, the patients more and they can triage them more, but you know, they don't want to take insurance. right? So, you know, why, those services can be, you know, rendered from a person that has a less qualified, um, a less qualified degree or a less. Uh, Can't hear you. <laughs> sorry. With a less, uh, a, a less robust degree, um, mm-hmm. you know, at, at least it's getting paid for it. What are your thoughts in and around that? I have to work with a lot of doctors. And to opine on something that is like fundamentally a clinical opinion kind of makes me nervous, I guess, is my thought. Um, So if you're looking for hot takes from me, I'm probably not the guy, right? Give me a hot take. Yeah. I think that you had a great hot take with the three stakeholders that have to be done. Like that's going as a hot take. Okay. Well, I think. I think so many of this isn't even a hot take. So many of the issues people, (laughs) people face from like their, their health standpoint, like they're so far down the road of becoming unhealthy. So it's like, yeah, doctors need to be in the mix to like prevent that stuff from getting worse. But like so many, so much of like 
the treatment that I feel like just isn't happening is just really common sense stuff that is like also really, really difficult to administer in terms of like an actual treatment to people. Like maybe you should sleep eight hours a night. Um, stuff like that. I, I don't know. It's not a hot take. It's just, who's gonna, who's gonna help the patients navigate how to get eight hours of sleep a night if they have three kids and are managing, um, an investment portfolio and, uh, has a lot of portfolio companies. Like, I don't know. T- tell us, how do you do it, David? I take a lot of melatonin. Mm. I di- Drugs. I disassoci- yeah. I disassociate <laughs> when I go home. <laughs> like I, li- I literally, my out. eye, my eyes like go sink back into my head and you just see the whites of my eyes and I just, I'm unresponsive. <sighs> right. Right. Um, yeah, my wife calls I, it checking out. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> this, mm. I check out of the hotel when I when I'm home. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know what all the answers are. I my core competency is helping people who do think they have the answers or have part of the answer um just not make the same mistakes. Um so like I've I've been I've been doing startups a long time now, at least by some, you know, some measure. And it's, it's like first time founders often make very similar kind of, they navigate this thing. Like we have like a lean startup playbook, right? And they make a lot of the same mistakes because in practice, it's just like a really hazy kind of fog of war type of environment. There's like a lot of problems and things that always turn up. And it's really hard to kind of navigate like, am I making one of those calls where I'm building too much right now? And it's nice to have like a third party in the mix who's kind of been through this before. Um, and yeah, it's it's almost like having somebody alongside you that can simultaneously like defer to the subject matter expertise that you carry into like a startup environment, but at the same time be like, okay, cool. How do we leverage that expertise and still deliver that value to your customers without boiling the ocean here? So yeah, I just, I know at this point, I I thought I knew about healthcare. I thought I knew some of the, the right things that just need to happen. And as I get older and more experienced in this domain, I feel like I know fewer and fewer of the answers because I don't know if there's any one right answer. I just want to see more founders successful and bringing novel solutions to the market. So, uh, yeah, I don't think there's one right silver bullet answer. Um, do you, what, what, what is your process uh, in working with founders in a perfect mm. scenario to find a wedge. Mm. So um, I, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with this wedge concept or if it's like a common thing nowadays, but you're saying like your MVP, your initial product market fit, the way you're going to break into the market, right? When you say wedge. Correct. Yeah, correct. Correct. Um, all right, this is, this is going to be frustrating to people who are like product people out there, but from my perspective, it's very much balancing those four risks, usability, feasibility, viability, and value. And the bar right now for usability in health tech is pretty low. So it's more of like enablement is usually my bar for for that sort of a situation so it's like hey can users get by can we get off the ground because there's usually a lot of other technical hurdles to jump through and then work with your your engineering leadership to say like okay trade trade horses on the feasibility side of things and what is the quickest thing that we can deliver into somebody's hands that they can put their hands on that we think might get them the value that they're looking for. And it's really just like an iteration. So my process is who are your partners in actually getting their hands on this? Are they 
a potential ideal customer? Are they a reference customer? And if so, how do we establish like a trusted relationship with them so that they're going to help us build our product and then iterate with them as quickly as possible and treat them really well? Because they, there's a lot of customer success in there. So mm-hmm. it's not really much of a process as it is just like a cookbook, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I wrote a blog post ages ago um, on nine steps to kind of bring a health tech product to market. Um, I think it might be on like the leases website or something like that. But um, a lot of it is customer success in navigating those customer relationships with your first 10 customers. And it can be tenuous because you might sell your product to a first customer who ends up being a really poor fit for your company. And that's a really common thing to come across. Um, Happens all the time. And a lot of times founders will go to the ends of the earth to please these customers. And it's hard to see, man, this was just never going to work. Or if I make this work, it might sink the company. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that was like literally every startup that I've, <laughs> I've done in healthcare. Uh, there, there was some flavor of that issue going on. So I know, um, I know this, this woman that's pretty prolific on, you know, kind of that founder market, you know, that founder led sales motion and that founder, you know, um, managed sales and she kind of plays in this murky area of, you know, one to two, you know, the first zero to $1 million of revenue mm-hmm. and really helping navigate the commercialization of, of the wedge or the series of products. Mm-hmm. And she says that, you know, bringing a product to market and it not really landing when you ask for their credit card, it's better practice to shift the market a little bit as opposed to shifting the product to try to, as you said, serve that customer. What do, what are your thoughts around that? You're asking, you're asking me my thoughts on shifting the conversation with your market. Correct. Um, like essentially, instead, instead, of, of, instead of going to, you know, that customer that said, eh, I don't want this. Maybe you go a little up market. Maybe you go a little down market. Maybe you go to a different vertical. I, I love that take. Um, this this woman I think very highly of Martina Lochenko says that you should be spending as much on marketing as you are on engineering as a startup. Um, and I haven't seen that in health tech. Um, but I also don't disagree with it. Um, so if you have the means to actually change the conversation with your market, uh, get people to evangelize like what your product does and work with like a good product marketer or a founder, to kind of craft that dialogue with your market and and steer that conversation, I, I absolutely love that. Um, it's basically doing your first. I don't know. This is this is what just kind of occurring to me. Your first couple of sales conversations at scale and shifting the way the paradigm that the market has around like the value you're delivering. Is that kind of what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, finding somebody else that might buy it versus trying to retool what you've already built, which they said Mm -hmm. they wanted, but now they actually don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Um, but then, but then you're kind of going against the grain on the founder bias, right? Which is very real. So how do you think about founder bias and navigating that? I think that at the end of the day, you have to listen to your market and understand what is a market need versus what is a customer need and to reconcile mm-hmm. that. It's just... I kind of want to just wave my hands and say, it looks like we've invalidated the original hypothesis. If you have like a strong opinion that something should work, but you have compelling evidence that it doesn't seem to be working at least like 
to get across the finish line in sales. If sales can't sell it, then like, hey, we have to change the conversation a little bit. So there has to be some pragmatism there. Right. Um, and you already have something, right? And it's you can probably validate that rather than putting engineers on new feature, hoping that they're going to buy the second time. Yeah. Are you going to double down and hope for a miracle or are you going to just <laughs> listen to your customers? <laughs> exactly. Are you going to listen to the market? Yeah. Um, double down, not listen, and just try something else, which is yeah. really insanity when you look at it. It is, but it's just we can all empathize with people who have worked in a certain domain for, you know, their entire career. And they're like, I know this is the problem. People, people aren't listening. Like we've all been in that place, but at the end of the day, it's like, you're not, you're not an artist here. We're just, we're trying to create a business and it, and it just needs to sell. Um, so again, really easy to sit back in our podcast chairs and say this, but like as a founder, incredibly difficult to let go of the solutions you've been working out in your mind for the better part of a decade. Um, so that's a, a, a real thing. And, and I think a lot of times where people or people's expectation and reality uh, become misaligned, it's because they really kind of latch on to solutions that they've already worked out ages ago. Um, so kind of backing up into the problem you're trying to solve and letting go of the solutions and saying like, Hey, what are we really doing here? What problem are we solving is an incredibly powerful mechanism. And that's something that like every founder, every person I've ever worked with engineering up and down the chain will hear me ask over and over and over again. And it's what my mentors kept asking me to get me to think more like a, a product person. That's good advice. So from a VC perspective or an investor perspective, taking a look mm. at founders that come from a certain situation mm. and want to take the capital that you've bestowed upon them and build the thing. Mm. What type, like, what's the number? What's the number of customer interviews that you feel is appropriate for that is empirical and not anecdotal anymore? Where oh. you have more trust versus less trust. Oh man, I want to like open up that um, book I lent to you right now. Um, Why startups fail, uh, T Tom Eisenman. Yes, this. Am I able to promote books on your podcast? You can, Is that you can promote you can, as long as you didn't write them. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so many. So so. This author, Tom Eisenman, advocated for, you know, the lean startup mentality, which is like, hey, you got to talk to your users. Um, and one of the biggest pitfalls that you have is these founders often talk to friends and family and get like, yeah, like people who want to support them. Um, and like a like very biased um, view on the viability of their, their idea and the value of their idea. And I guess what I would say is like, change it a little bit. I would want to see founders who have put some money behind some initial MVP and actually taken it to their market and seen significant traction and response and like checks being written. Um, or like clear, like intent to proceed if like a very clear thing is delivered and not be like, so focused on the solution, but on like, Hey, we validated that this is a problem people are willing to pay to solve. Um, so I, I don't know if it's really the number of interviews because in the end, it's always going to be qu like qualitative and biased. And it like goes through this, this founder, rose colored glasses if they're asking for money they're i have a sneaking suspicion they're very very far down the i'm locked into my solution kind of path <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly this is happening thank you for the advice but this is happening um that same woman that said that to move markets instead of add features she also was really big in you know identifying pain points 
by within discovery asking how the customer manages or measures the problem that you are trying to solve currently. Love it. And if they're not doing that, the pain doesn't have legs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a pain point, but it's not the number one pain point. Yeah. Yeah. What does this cost? What is this costing you right now? If they can't, ah, this is a million dollar a year problem. If right. they, if your customers can't answer that question easily, you're like, how far do I need to dig before I can like justify a solution to this thing? Is right. this really the problem that I need to solve? Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. Nick, if I'm a healthcare founder or just any founder that wants to pick your brain about MVPs, products, customer discovery, how do they get in touch with you? Nick? Knowing that you have very little time because you're, you're, <laughs> working, you're working with stuff for me, but... Just look me up on LinkedIn um, or you can email me at um, nick at Title Digital Health Partners. Um, yeah, I'm available. I'll talk to you. I'd love to exchange ideas. Is that the is that the official name, Digital Health Partners? Idle Digital Health Partners. Yes. I li- I know you were lo- you were looking for the name. I like that. Yeah. I like that better I than landed. neon. <laughs> it was going to be was... neon for a while, but no, that name, I don't. That name I don't think stupid. that one had legs. Yeah. Yeah. God, stupid. <laughs> God, how can I, like, I have thought I like, that? <laughs> I like that's like the name of like a strip club. Not. Yeah, 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 and that's what we were b- battling. We were like, hmm. It turns out there's like a huge agency uh, in Hollywood. Actually, they do like visual effects and stuff yeah. for for movies. So Call seems appropriate like for hi- that. Yeah, or or like highlighter. Like that would be like another name of the strip club. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Capital Stack. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, tell a friend, and if you've listened to this, I want to hear from you. I want you to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email. Um, you can find all that information on in the show notes, but I want to hear about what you like about this podcast, what you don't like. I'm trying to make it better. So please go ahead and do that. And we will see you next week. We drop an episode every Tuesday. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Capital Stack Podcast. Make sure to share this with someone you know that can benefit from this content. Remember to support this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. David Paul is the founder and general partner at DWP Capital. All opinions expressed by David and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of DWP Capital. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. David and guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.